I think I'll introduce you one after one and then start with you, Lourdes. Uh, if you could tell us what you feel are the major challenges related to the tax evasion industry in El Salvador and Guatemala, where you work. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm Salvadorian, but I'm working right now in Guatemala, so I'm going to talk about Guatemala because in El Salvador we don't have extractive industries in great, in great scale, just arti in an artisan's way. Uh, well, in Guatemala, uh, I want to speak about three kinds of challenge. And the first one, about human rights and extractive industries. In Guatemala, extractive industries, and especially mining, because oil is a little bit small, the exploitation of oil in Guatemala. Mining is related to a lot of conflicts. Marielle already explained it, and I don't want to deep, go too deep into it because she already said that. But the cost, just for, to give you a number, in the, uh, out of 10 municipalities with mining activities, 8% want any time of social conflict. But if you see, uh, if you took um, 10 municipalities without mining activities, just 1% of any kind of social conflict. So there is a correlation between uh, the existence of extractive industries and conf social conflicts between a community. What are the reasons that people, uh, what, why these conflicts exist in Guatemala? First, because people perceive that uh, extractive industries provoke a lot of environmental damage, especially in water, in, in woods, and the deforestation of the woods. Um, the second one is because they perceive that government, that the authority, the public authorities, are not doing anything to solve these conflicts and are pro-mining or pro-oil, and they don't want to help people, just uh, companies. This is one kind of the challenge. The role of the, the state, the, the public authorities, and the, perce the perception of the, of the communities. The second one is in terms of economic and fiscal uh, matters. In Guatemala, extractive industries are presented as the, the, that the economy is sustained in these kind of activities. If you go and see national accounts, Extractive industries represent less than 1% of the GDP. So we are having a lot of social conflicts, and in terms of GDP, uh, these this, this kind of activities represent almost nothing. In terms of employment, the, the population of Guatemala is around 15 million people. Uh, around 10 are, part, can, are in age of being a worker. But just 9,000 people work in extractive industries in Guatemala. So it, we all know that extractive industries are not creating a lot of jobs. So that's the, the, the argument that the economy of Guatemala is based on extractive industries is false. We are, we are having a lot of trouble in social aspects and in economics uh, we are not uh, perceiving that much. It doesn't work. It. Benedict already told us Guatemala uh, is the country in Latin America that has the, uh, the minimal uh, tax burden in the region is just around 11, 12 percent. In the specific case of extractive industries in Guatemala, it just, it, the tax burden is around 5 and 8 percent. What does it mean this to the revenues for the state? It just implies, it just all point three of the total revenues of the states of Guatemala, <coughs> sorry, pro, um, are from uh, extractive industries. So it's around just 400,000, 400 million dollars. It's not that much in terms of the, of the budget of Guatemala. And finally, in terms of transparency, what are the, are, what are the biggest challenge? Guatemala has one limitation <coughs> Uh, to the publication of uh, information about the payment of taxes and financial information. And, it's con and, it, and it is contained, it is contained in a law. Which law is this? The Constitution of the Republic. So it's not any law, it's the Constitution. So transparency in Guatemala 
especially financial transparency and fiscal transparency, is limited by the Constitution. Guatemala, um, on April of this year, was uh, got the certification of as uh, ITI country compliant, but this initiative doesn't recognize the limitation. EITI is voluntary in, in all of the countries, but in Guatemala it's even more, even more voluntary. Enterprises just give what, what they want in, and how they want. So we, Priyam um, already showed us that EITI just showed a little bit of the picture. And uh, so in Guatemala, it's really difficult to have this little bit of the picture, <laughs> this little piece of the picture. So that's, uh, those are the main um, challenges in Guatemala. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. <coughs> uh, next, we are going to listen to Juan Herrera from Ecuador. He uh, works for the organization Grupo Faro, and uh, he is uh, a member of a network uh, on the structural industries in, ex in Ecuador and has been in a dialogue with the uh, mining industry. Mm -hmm. um, you have five minutes. Thank you. First of all, um, we, we were talking that as a protest, we will speak in Spanish. <laughs> so, um, well, um, experts, I don't know if we are experts. Uh, I think we, we here in the, in the room, we have 20, 21 experts from Latin America. Everyone uh, expert in the ground field. So I, I encourage uh, to you to, to, to ask them any question. And we have a lot of, a lot of experience. Uh, so. Uh, after after this, we, you you can talk with them and, and ask ask them whatever you want. So to start, uh, I will quickly speak about Ecuador. Ecuador is an Ecuador is an, an oil country. Uh, we have been exploiting oil for for almost forty years, for more than forty years. You can say like Norway. Um, the, the oil is very important for our economy. Uh, the 60% the of, the, uh, of, the, of the share of the exports are, uh, are come from oil. 15 to 20% of the government budget is, is come from, from oil. The 10% of tax collection uh, also come from, from oil. And oil represents almost the 15% of GDPs, uh, of Ecuador's GDP. So we exploit like a, 500,000 barrels per day. Um, we are now starting with, with large-scale mining sector in Ecuador. Um, we also have a, a new bidding process to develop new projects uh, at the Amazon region and the South Amazon region. Um, we have a strong presence of China in, in our uh, investments from China, in not only in extractive industries, but in, in other sectors. Um, we have uh, our, our our state budget is calculated uh, is with an estimated oil price. So for, for 2015, the, the the price is 80 dollars per barrel. So we are like uh, very opti optimistic about the, the the price of oil. So the challenges uh, about this topic, this this especially uh, special topic of tax avoidance in Latin America and in Ecuador, I think is to have the, the debate. To, to, to set in, the, in our agenda the debate uh, of tax avoidance and the importance of transparency in, in the topic. I think um, in Latin America and Ecuador, uh, the, debate, the, the debate is very weak. The debate about uh, this topic is very weak. Um, in Ecuador, in, in our case in Ecuador, we are uh, celebrating that we have the, a very advanced model contract uh, for oil industry, uh, one of the best model contract for mining. Uh, but we all are forgetting this this path uh, between you sign the contract and you receive the revenues. That in this path you can have these these things like like tax havens, the, like transfer prices, like derivative. Uh, so we are forgetting that, and I think uh, we have uh, weak institutions that it can't control it. So uh, we, we strongly need uh, to set out the debate in, in our countries of, of the importance of, of these, these topics. Um, also, uh, I think the, the advocacy work that uh, publish what you pay, your organization like publish what, like publish what you pay, 
uh, do in, in, in Norway uh, or worldwide is very important because um, any decision that, that, that can be promoted here, here in Norway will have also consequences in our countries. So if you have a, a strong uh, initiative like extended, extended country by country report that uh, needs to uh, claims to, to the companies to, to, to publish the, 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 the revenues and their costs and their costs. Uh, and also uh, you can enforce that, that uh, law, uh, enforce it in a, in a law or something. I think it could be it, it, it could have very good consequences in our countries uh, too. Um, I think this is about uh, the topic of tax avoidance. Uh, we also in, in, in Ecuador and in Latin America have have problems like an equity conflict, uh, oil distribution, revenue distribution, environmental a lot of environmental uh, problems, prior consultation conflicts uh, from extractive industries. Um, that, uh, as, I, as I said, here we have 21 experts from Latin America, so, so you can talk uh, with them after, after the conference. Thank you. We are moving directly to Colombia. Uh, we have Andres Hernandez. He is, um, he is the regional director of the area of uh, um, Ciudadanía, citizen, uh, citizenship, right? Yeah, you have an area of citizenship, yeah. or it's more citizens participation. Yeah, it's citizen participation. Yeah, uh, of Transparency International. He's been for many years. He was the regional coordinator for Transparency International in Latin America. And he's also working closely with uh, EITV in Colombia uh, on the extractive industry, particularly. Please. Thank you, and thanks as well to Publish What You Pay for, for the invitation. And, and uh, as Franco said, mentioned, we're very honored to be here, uh, the 21 participants of the TRACE program this year, and, and we've had a great couple of weeks learning a lot of issues here. And uh, going straight to, to the issue in Colombia, uh, I wanted to, to mention three or four points. The first one is that, that Colombia has a historical challenge, uh, um, which is peace. And agreeing on, on peace is right now uh, what probably matters the most to all Colombians. Uh, and, and, and I mention this uh, because there's a strong relationship between peace, uh, taxes, uh, and the possibility of a society like a Colombian society of, of reaching uh, or overcoming the, the conflict, the armed conflict. Uh, there are several analyses and, and research that, that says, that show the importance of high taxes uh, rates uh, compared to the violence levels and, and uh, some data from the World Bank and the United Nations Office on, on, dry, on Drugs and Crime show how specifically societies with high taxes has, have low levels of, of uh, homicides and, and violence. And uh, well, what you see exactly in, in, in Colombia and other countries in Latin America is that we have very low taxes and high rates of homicides. Um, somehow, uh, or, or states have uh, taken the decision of, of uh, not using taxes as a mean to uh, increase uh, the quality of life or improve the quality of life in, in our countries. And, uh, and uh, one would thought that taxes uh, would uh, uh, or should be paid in Italy by, by, by all both people or companies represented in the country, but. Uh, there's, there's a special responsibility in, in the extractive industry. Uh, Colombia, as other countries in Latin America, for many, many years has now uh, become an, an oil and mining product, producer company, uh, country. And, uh, and, and what is interesting is that uh, most of the foreign uh, investment that has arrived to the country and, and to many countries in Latin America, as Benedict, Benedict mentioned some, uh, a moment ago, uh, come not necessarily from uh, developing developed countries, but actually from um, tax havens, from Panama, from Antigua, from, from Bermuda. And um, this investment go back again to these countries and to those to these uh, uh, tax uh, havens uh, as, as uh, profits. And, uh, and those profits are not being taxed. And, and one, one 
a, a mean to, to show this is, or to explain this, uh, is that, uh, for example, in Colombia, um, coal exports have been increased since 1992 and uh, 2012 uh, 15 times, while registered prices have increased only less than three times. So we are actually, again, uh, not using that tool that the state has of using taxes to actually increase of, of our opportunities for have better security, to have better um, uh, quality of, of life and, and to reduce violences in, in, in our countries. Uh, in Colombia we have, for example, um, windfall tax and, and we have a very interesting and, and complex, of course, tax system. But, uh, but this, this has proof that it's not enough and, and uh, uh, extraordinary uh, profits that are being made but, but uh, multinational companies are actually not uh, leaving uh, what uh, the society in Colombia needs. Uh, and and um, one uh, example of this as well is that uh, research shows that those municipalities in Colombia that uh, have had a lot of uh, mining activity uh, in, the, in the recent years have the, the poorest social and, uh, and um, human rights uh, indicators. Uh, and it's uh, very questionable how two municipalities that are neighbors, in one you have mining activity very active and in the other you don't have any mining activity. The one with mining, as, as uh, Lourdes mentioned, has uh, the most complex, complex social uh, conflicts uh, has the lower uh, rate of, of uh, employment, uh, high uh, poor in, uh, poverty indicators, etc. Uh, so, so this is actually an issue that uh, uh, a country like Colombia, that it's actually trying to uh, become part of the OECD, that it's uh, actually uh, trying to implement uh, a lot of international standards such as the EITI, uh, needs to address in a very careful and very concrete uh, mean. Um, that, that's why our interest in, in, in the organization I work with, Transparencia por Colombia, uh, remains very much in how we can see the money, follow the money, and ensure that the money is actually being spent uh, in what uh, people really need. Uh, but uh, one thing that I, we, we have also seen is that uh, people at local level in Colombia is not necessarily interested in, in the money, in having the revenue coming to their uh, municipalities and, and uh, funding important uh, public and social investment. Uh, people are also, and sometimes more, much more concerned about the uh, environmental impact of the extractive activities. So somehow we question ourselves, okay, what, what is it that we are doing? We're looking after the transparency of the revenues, but, but be careful, actually we shouldn't even be thinking about the, the, the extractive revenue when the, the environmental impact is, is uh, it's so big. Um, and, and this is a question that, that we have to address, we have to uh, link closer the environmental, the transparency and the tax agenda. And one would thought that these issues are not linked, but they're actually linked and, and, and they are producing outcomes and, and, and affecting uh, living conditions in our countries. Um, I just want to close with, with one point that, that Marielle mentioned. Uh, very interesting about uh, environmental impact assessments and, and in Colombia these assessments are needed to um, uh, being allowed uh, to explore and, and to exploit uh, uh, mineral resources and, and non-renewable uh, resources but one interesting thing that, that is happening in Colombia is that actually for, for the purpose of conducting these assessments uh, companies are, are not even uh, now interested in, in bribing or, or uh, uh, violating human rights of those communities, they are just copy pasting the environmental uh, impact assessment from one place to the other. And, and what, what happens is that the state has again um, quit uh, uh, about its right of, of conducting control over that activity. So it, it's not, well, of course, there's a lot of, of social unrest. And in Colombia, actually, the, the, the main cause of social unrest at this point in Colombia is not even conflict or, uh, um, or I don't know, guerrillas or paramilitaries. It's actually environmental and social problems related to extractive industries. Um, so, so there's a lot of, uh, of um, areas that, that we actually need to address, looking at the point that Juan Jose was mentioning, 
how actually the state is being able to uh, use its capacity to control and, and the strength that it has to achieve the goals of a society. Thank you very much. Uh, and then now we will have the pleasure of, um, of listening to Rosemary Kispe. She is from Bolivia. Um, she works for an organization that is called CIA. CEAPL. Um, she's particularly interested in gender, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples, and the role of the of the youth in, in society. Gracias, Rosemary. Eh, muchas gracias a ustedes. Eh, buenas tardes a todos eh, los participantes. Eh, thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you who are participating. Sí, lamentablemente no hablo inglés ni noruego, entonces. I don't speak English or Norwegian, so I'll be giving my presentation in Spanish. Empiezo con una un cuestionamiento que es angustiante para los bolivianos. I would like to begin with a question that is causing anguish among Bolivians. Que es saber dónde está nuestra riqueza y nuestro dinero. We want to know where is our wealth and where is our money. Históricamente hemos sido un país exportador de materia prima. Historically, we have been a country that has exported raw materials. Y la prueba de ello es que uno de los departamentos más empobrecidos ha sido productor de plata y estaño. Proof of this is that one of the most uh, impoverished states that we have has been a producer of silver. Que míticamente nos dicen que podría haberse construido un puente de plata desde Bolivia hasta España. So much silver has been extracted that a bridge could have been built all of silver from Bolivia all the way to Spain. Y nuevamente nos preguntamos dónde está esta riqueza. So we ask ourselves again, where is this wealth? Hoy estamos ante un nuevo Potosí. Today we are experiencing a new Potosí. Porque hemos, eh, somos uno de los eh, mayores productores de gas because we are one of the largest producers y of gas en menor medida de petrol and some oil que ha tomado mucho mayor fuerza a partir de los años 90 and this has uh, begun to be even more since 1990s pero por los gobiernos eh, neoliberales existentes en ese tiempo estas empresas estratégicas de Bolivia han sido privatizadas but because of the neoliberal um, uh, governments that existed during the time, most of these country companies had been privatized. Hasta el año 2005, el, hasta el año 2005, las empresas pertenecían a las empresas transnacionales. Until 2005, these companies belonged to the foreign companies. No generando ningún tipo de ganancia significativa para el desarrollo económico de Bolivia. They weren't generating any significant development for Bolivia. Una de las fortalezas más grandes del pueblo boliviano es la lucha del movimiento social. One of the greatest strengths of the Bolivian people is their social movements and their social fighters. Demostrada en los diversos movi movilizaciones que exigían la recuperación de el agua, el gas y el petróleo. And this was shown in the various conflicts that took place to uh, demand that we recover our oil, our gas, and our water. Esto ha posibilitado un cambio en el ámbito económico, político y cultural de nuestro país. This caused economic, political, and cultural changes in our country. Y eh, se genera una nueva política o un planteamiento de nueva política dentro de Bolivia que tenía que nacionalizar los hidrocarburos. This caused Bolivia to propose a new policy which was to nationalize hydrocarbons. Contábamos con eh, auditorías petroleras antes de que se nacionalicen los hidrocarburos que demostraban un incumplimiento completo de las empresas transnacionales en la inversión eh, de, la, de los hidrocarburos en Bolivia. We had audits from the previous privatized companies and when we evaluated them, well, we were able to see that they had not at all fulfilled what they were supposed to have done in our country. Pese a esto, las empresas transnacionales eh, logran obtener una indemnización por parte del Estado boliviano. Despite this, when they were nationalized, foreign countries were paid by our government. Por lo que hablamos ahora de una renegociación de contratos a partir del 2005. 
So as of 2005, what we talk about is a renegotiation of the contract. A través de esto, la empresa estatal boliviana YPFB logra obtener un porcentaje mayoritario dentro de las, eh, del tema hidrocarburífero. After this, the state-owned company was able to own a majority portion of any company that works in our country. Y las empresas transnacionales como Chaco y Transredes y también Andina quedan con porcentajes menores. So the private companies that stayed in the country and renegotiated their contracts, Chaco, Transredes, and Andina and others, were, are now receiving a much smaller portion. A través de una ley de hidrocarburos promulgada en 2005 se establece eh, un incremento, un impuesto directo de los hidrocarburos. The new hydrocarbons law, which was passed in 2005, establishes a new tax called the direct hydrocarbon tax. Antes obteníamos una renta del 18% y posteriormente con la eh, nueva ley se obtiene el 50%. We used to receive a tax of 18% and now we receive over 50%. Existe entonces a partir de este de 2006 una gran bonanza económica en Bolivia. So therefore after 2006 we had an economic boom in Bolivia. Pero esto se debe a los altos precios de los eh, del petróleo y del gas que ha beneficiado de gran manera al gobierno nacional. But this has actually been due to the high prices of oil and gas and this has been a benefit for the Bolivian government. También se han incrementado grandes volúmenes de explotación y exportación. The amounts that we exploit and export have also increased significantly. Entonces nos encontrábamos ante un gran auge y una gran bonanza económica en Bolivia. So we find ourselves in an economic boom in Bolivia. Y se ha invertido en carreteras, en aeropuertos, en instalaciones deportivas. So we have invested in highways, in airports, in sports facilities en algunas escuelas, instalaciones hospitalarias y también en una renta a, a, los, eh, a las personas de la tercera edad. We are also building schools, hospitals, and medical centers, and we now have um, a retirement fund for people who are retiring. Entonces, eh, lo que se hace es que toda la renta petrolera es distribuida a los gobiernos departamentales y a los gobiernos municipales a las universidades y un fondo indígena. So the income from the oil and gas is being redistributed to the state governments, the city governments, the universities, and a fund that is specially set up for indigenous communities. Pese a esto, este problema, o oh, existen problemas de inequidad todavía porque hay departamentos que obtienen más presupuestos que otros. There is still inequality, however, because there are some states that receive more money than others. Uno de los cuestionamientos grandes es que existe un mayor porcentaje de presupuesto dentro de los municipios y departamentos que eh, cumplen la función, unas funciones importantes dentro del Estado como la educación, la salud. So one of the questions that we have is that some of these funds are being transferred to states where they have a lot of, that where they are doing a lot of work on education and health. Entonces cubrimos gastos permanentes con algo que puede acabarse y agotarse. So we are funding all of these uh, specific costs with money that comes from something that will eventually run out. Y ahí viene nuestra pregunta nuevamente, ¿en qué se invierten las ganancias? That's why we ask ourselves, what are we investing our earnings in? Algunas investigaciones que se han realizado nos dicen que se canaliza hacia pequeñas empresas de servicios, Comercio, transporte, consultoría y construcción. Some of this money is being invested in small service companies, transportation companies, commerce, and other small industries. Entonces no se desarrolla una actividad productiva ni se reinvierte en los espacios locales. So local, it is not being reinvested in the local arena and it is not being invested in companies that it should be ni se beneficia a las comunidades indígenas de donde sale, donde, donde se extrae la, el gas. And it also does not benefit the indigenous communities from where these uh, products are extracted. Eh, existe entonces una alta circulación de efectivo en Bolivia, pero no se está invirtiendo en cosas productivas que sostengan la economía boliviana. So we do have a lot of circulation of money in Bolivia at this time, but it's not being reinvested in 
the productive arena where we could, which we could use for sustainable development in Libya. Existen cuestionamientos de qué grupos o sectores se están beneficiando de esta gran bonanza. Cuáles son las élites económicas y políticas que existen. We ask ourselves which are the groups that are benefit, benefiting from this economic boom. And we see that it is mostly economic and political elites. A nivel central también se exige el mayor, eh, la mayor transparencia de información en relación a cuánto realmente percibe la empresa estatal YPCB. There's also some questions about how much the state-owned company YPFB is actually earning and receiving. Tenemos Perdón, la información. Rosemary. Perdón. Es muy interesante, pero se acabó hace mucho tiempo el tiempo. <laughs> eh, eh, Podemos quizás seguir con una pregunta. Sí. Thank you to the panel for very interesting. Uh, Presentations. Uh, my name is Knut Yelizet. I have been briefly in Ecuador, but not much more of Latin America. Uh, I have some questions just concerning your uh, national tax revenue offices. Uh, is it possible for you to work together with your national tax revenue offices? Are they on your side? Like, have you got an alliance with these people, or are they not really in the in the presence in this debate in your countries? Thank you. Uh, your question, was it directed to any in particular or to all of them? Sure. Okay, uh, would you like to, to start one? Sure, very brief. The question is yes, we are able to talk. They're very friendly and uh, very professional and very good people. But as Lourdes said, uh, we all have a, a constitutional principle of uh, tax confidentiality and that's it. So they very, have very nice people, but uh, they cannot provide any information. Uh, the question is all the contrary that Andre said. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of difficult. In, in Ecuador, uh, we have a, 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 a difficult relationship between uh, CS, uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, and the state. So uh, there's, uh, there's a lack of information. Uh, I, I don't know if, it's, if, if this is because they don't produce it. I think it's because uh, of, of we can't access to, to that information. So uh, we, we, we try to work uh, promoting transparency and we need some, some information about taxes and extractive industries. We have to, to, to do some official, official information requests and that stuff and sometimes we get answers and sometimes not. Could I just ask a very brief follow-up question? Is there any movement to remove that uh, constitutional tax uh, confidentiality that you find in many countries in Latin America? In Guatemala, no, there's not. And it's very complicated because this principle is, in, is contained in the part of the constitution that needs a lot, needs a referendum, needs two uh, national assemblies to, to modify the constitution. So it's not that easy and there is no political will. There is no discussion about that. and. Not the government, nor the companies, recognize the limitation and the impl implication of the of this principle contained in the constitution. Guatemala, no. Uh, I think Rosemary wants to say something. In the case of Bolivia, for example, existe una in en, en el marco constitucional está la participación y el control social. Pero a pesar de esto no se hace efectivo, no es posible encontrar información dentro de la empresa estatal, por ejemplo, del mismo gobierno. In Bolivia, as part of the constitution, there is a part that says that the social movements shall have control and participation in decisions made. But it's impossible to find the information within the state-owned company. Hi, my name is Cecilia Aish. I'm a PhD student and I work at the Center for Development and the Environment. Thank you so much to all of you for very interesting presentations. Um, I have many questions, but I have to choose a couple, I think. And my question goes to the representative from Ecuador. And one is, if you could uh, please comment a bit on the case of Chevron uh, in Ecuador. And the other one is also if you could say something about how the increased uh, revenues are being used in Ecuador. Um, well, uh, I will pass 
in the first question because I will encourage you to talk with, with, with Tania, with Mauricio. They, they are experts about this topic and then you can... Raise your hand. Yeah, raise your hand. Yeah. And Tania? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, I really, I really think you, you should, you should talk with, uh, with her, with them. I, I, I could, I could talk uh, about this, but, but I encourage you to talk with, with, with them uh, later. Uh, regarding the, the second, the second question was, uh, can you repeat it, please? Yeah, I was just wondering how the increased revenues, incomes in, in Ecuador are being used now. What kind yeah, of investment uh, is the government doing with the increase? Yeah, uh, government government has increased revenues uh, from from oil, also from from other sectors. Uh, one one of those is the the tax tax regime, the tax the tax collect collect. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of, of of the two sides of investment. Uh, there there are investment in salaries, in, in bureaucracy, in, in new estate companies, etc. And there are also investment in in in, in a, a, a higher investment in education. In health, in, in, in roads, so we have uh, both sides, uh, but we also, uh, I think, we also don't have any saves, so we are we are spending like every everything is uh, that is is is, is revenue. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank all of you, the participants and the other participants in the dialogue, for being here today. Uh, we have we will have now some time um, to mingle and to. Uh, you can talk more, more freely with, with the participants. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to be here today.